Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to church today. We would appreciate everyone signing the friendship register and passing it down so we have a chance to figure out who's here today. We invite you to plan to stay afterwards for a few minutes to attend Anita's reception in the fellowship hall. Remember today? The 2016 giving envelopes and giving statements are ready to be picked up in the parlor. Come celebrate Martin King, Martin King, King Day tomorrow at, at, for the FCH service project. We will meet at the church parking lot at 9 a.m. And groups will be assigned their tasks. Make sure you dress warmly in old clothes and shoes that can get dirty. Lunch will also be provided, and the pickup will be at 12.30. Next Sunday will be the state of the church address. Dress. Dinner will be at 5 o'clock, and the state of the church address will be given at 6. The membership committee will host the dinner, which will have soup, hot dogs, a cheese platter, dessert, drinks, and table service. After that's all done, let's prepare our hearts and minds for the prayer loop. If those who are able, please stand and join me in the call to worship. It is the second Sunday of Epiphany. Where do we find God's glories reveal? Let us all prepare ourselves through worship. To find God's glory revealed in the world around us. Our opening hymn is number 183. We meet you here, O Christ.
Join me in the invocation. Oh God, this is the one place where we're expected to encounter your presence and your glory. In the wood, we read and preach. In the beauty, music, and music. In silence and in prayer and at the table. Open our hearts and minds to your epiphany here and now. Help us to be on the lookout for further glimpses of epiphany in our lives throughout this coming week. Amen. The children may now come down for children's moment. Good morning. Good morning. That's all right. Good morning. Have you ever seen signs? No. No? Yeah. Signs on the road. Signs for your favorite restaurant. If you're going to see the sign for your favorite restaurant in town, what restaurant would that be? I Pizza. Pizza Hut. <laughs> McDonald's. Does that cover it for everyone? Pizza Hut and McDonald's is all we need. We have a full life if we have Pizza Hut and McDonald's, right? My nephews this week, they um, came home and their mom had a bag of apples. And they said, are those for us? And they said, yes. And they said, we are the luckiest people ever. Their mom was like, why didn't I get them a bag of apples instead of all those toys for Christmas? <laughs> Would you rather have apples and to instead of toys? No. Me either. My nephews are, are funny people. So signs, going back to signs. So you see signs all the time, right? Um, in your classrooms at school, how many people go to school? In your classrooms at school, do your teachers have signs, things that like help you learn or help you know how to behave in class or you know those kinds of signs, yeah? Um, sometimes signs are unwritten. Probably your parents um, expect you to behave well with a brother or a sister, right? Yeah, do they have signs on the wall that say behave well with your brother or sister? But they let you know, don't they? Yeah, there are signs. If you could make a sign for all the world to tell people how you feel about God, if you could make a sign to tell all the world how you feel about God, what would your sign say? Luke? Luke? Love God. John 3.16, which says, Perfect. You may not have heard it, but it was perfect. Anyone else? Do you have a sign that you'd want the world to know about God? What, what about it, Charvel? You do have signs in your craft room. Is that at school? Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. How do you feel about God, Charvel? Do you love God? Would you tell the whole world that if you could? Uh, I don't know if I have a sign. Oh, that's all right. That's all right. Because here's my point. By your actions... And by your words, you are a living sign. If you treat people well because you believe in God, then the world sees that. If you treat people poorly, the, people, the, the world sees that, right? People see if you've treated someone well or not. Someone sitting alone in a corner, if you go and be their friend, that's a good thing, right? Well, as other people are watching you, that's your sign to them. Someone in the cafeteria gets made fun of. You can either point fingers and laugh along, or you can help make someone feel better. 
that would be more a way to live for God in the world, right? That's more what Jesus would do. You, by your words and by your actions, are a sign. We don't need to make signs. We just live. And as we live, we reveal to the world what we think about God. Let's pray. God, help us to be a good sign for you that through us people can know your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming up. Good morning. Good morning. That was pretty good. I like it. Thank you for braving the elements and being here this morning. Um, did you see the sign where it says, cold? It's warm inside. <laughs> That's only been true about half of the week. <laughs> we were without heat in the Christian Education Building about half the week. So um, we were lying. Our sign was lying to the world. <laughs> it was not warm inside. Um, but... Uh, and, and so I want to say thanks to Annetta who came to work and it was 52 degrees in her office and she braved it for a few hours and then went home. And then the next day, same thing, but then she came in even a little extra on Friday and we're going to celebrate her well today, her eight and a half years of service. So looking forward to going from the sanctuary to the um, fellowship hall after service today and hope that you will be able to join us. <clears throat> excuse me, especially on a day when many couldn't get here because of the elements. So I hope we can celebrate um, our, 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 our working relationship and our friendship with um, Annetta today. <coughs> I would share with you uh, many concerns from our congregation this week. Um, Gina's friend Aaron, who we prayed for last week, has gone home from the hospital in Peoria and has a monitor, and so we keep him in our thoughts Karen Chatterton wrote a note and sent it with Bob. I don't know if she didn't trust you to get the details right or not, Bob, but um, <laughs> their son-in-law, Ronnie Runner, has a brother named Jan who fell and hit his head and um, has a cut, had a broken finger, broken ribs, was struggling to breathe and wasn't dealing well with the pain and is in ICU here in McDonough District Hospital. So we'll keep Jan in our prayers. Um, Mitra Williams' sister also had a fall this week in Cleveland, and her name is Connie Matozzi. Not too bad. All right. I'm not Italian, but <laughs> um, she fell in Cleveland, and she um, has a brain bleed and some facial fractures, and it, it's very serious. And so, Mitra, we keep you and your whole family in our prayers today. Um, a friend of Patty Jones's. Jim Kester, his wife Kathy, um, died unexpectedly, and so we keep the Kester family in our prayers in you, Patty. We keep Karen Chatterton in our prayers. She had surgery this week for a hernia. She seems to be doing well. She said that if anybody asked, she was fair. fair. Compared, to perfect. Compared to perfect. So. Bob says she's doing well. Um, Ann and I saw her on Friday night. She seemed to be um, doing well, but she was, you know, on good drugs at that point. So um, <laughs> she may not be on as strong a medication at the moment. We pray for um, Joyce Randall, who will be going into the hospital this week for an outpatient surgery, we hope. So we pray that all will go well. But uh, you just go with our prayers. And we're going to feed you. And Gail, we're going to feed you. Get over it. So... She and I were having a bit of an argument about that earlier this morning. Also, Karen um, Chatterton's sister, Sharon Spangler, had a surgery this last week that was more complicated than I understood it, but she's going to be off her feet for like two straight months. Um, she can't walk at all for two straight months. No pressure on her foot. Lots of repair work on one of her um, feet. And so she will, uh, she will be needing patients, and so we pray for that patience for her. Sharon Spangler, seems like the surgery went well, but she's just going to be um, not able to put any pressure on her foot. 
we pray for Jim Ray. As we mentioned last week, we continue our prayers for Martin Alvarado, Brad Becker, Sue Boyer, Kent Woodford, and Teresa Munier. We pray for our college students who will go back to school this week. We pray for our world where ISIS and Al-Qaeda seem to want to continue to bring chaos and violence into our world. We pray for our relationship with Iran that seems to be bringing people who have been imprisoned home, not making a, a political statement at all, but it's big news that people are leaving Iran and people are leaving the United States. And I don't know what that means at all, to be honest with you. But people are coming home who haven't been home for some time, and we can at least celebrate that. We pray for our world to just be a better place. And in a political season, that seems hard to understand what that might be or what that might mean or what that might look like because everybody keeps trying to tell us exactly how at least our part of the world can be better. So today we just bring our hearts and our souls and our minds, we bring them to God and we just pray for hope and help and peace. As we begin our morning prayer, let's start with a bit of silence. Let us reconnect with our God. Let us center on the one who is the center of our faith. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, we especially remember those whom we've named this day. We know that the list is longer, that there are others who are in need of your presence in their lives, and so we lift them now to people who are on our hearts and our minds, but too close to mention. We pray for your help. We pray for the healing which you might bring. We pray for medical teams, doctors, nurses, technicians, who can use their expertise and their wisdom and their gifts given to them by you to be your instruments of healing. God, we pray for our world where there seems to be less understanding and more yelling, where there seems to be less compassion and ever more ownership of you. So many who claim to have the only relationship with you, too many who claim to say that if you don't believe my way, you've got it wrong, too many who are willing to use their beliefs to bring violence into the world. God, we pray for your peace, for your patience. As we gather on this weekend, we are mindful. We are mindful that one who has fallen proclaimed that he had a dream. As we remember the life of Martin Luther King Jr., God, we give thanks that he tried peacefully to bridge the racial divide, that he tried to help people see that there is a better way, a peaceful way, a way where we can all get along. We pray that we can be as strong in our faith as he was in his. He followed in the footsteps of your son, proclaimed that first. Help us to do the same. 
Help us to proclaim our faith in Jesus the Christ first. And then, and then live in such a way that we can be assigned to the world by our actions and our deeds. May we be your presence in this world. God, give us the strength and the courage to follow you wherever you might lead us. We pray this in the name of the Christ who followed you even to the cross and who taught us to pray saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. The song this morning um, was written in 1968 to honor four men, Abraham Lincoln, John Kennedy, Martin Luther King Jr., and Bobby Kennedy, who all in their own unique way were involved in the civil rights movement and also to keep our country together and free. All of their lives were ended too soon by assassin's bullets, so I dedicate this song this morning to all young American lives who have died too soon to keep us all free. <clears throat> Just looked around and he's gone. Has anybody here seen my old friend John? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seemed the good guy young. Just looked around and he's gone. Has anybody here seen my old friend Martin? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people, but it seemed the good die young. I just looked around and he's gone. Didn't you just love the things they stood for? Didn't they try to find some good for you and me? And we'll be free. Someday soon, it's going to be one day. Has anybody here seen my old friend Bobby? Can you tell me where he's gone? He freed a lot of people. 
it seems I could die young. I just looked around and he's gone. I thought I saw him walking up over the hill with Abraham and Martin and John. Thank you, Bill. Thank you very much. There are some who say that they would rather die than speak in public. Give me this all day. I would never do that. <laughs> that is beautiful and a great tribute. Thank you so much. Our scripture today comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 2, verses 1 through 11. A pretty familiar passage at this time in the Christian calendar. A pretty familiar passage. You will... Remember it, I'm sure, as we read it. If you'd like to read along, it's printed in the bulletin. If you'd like to just listen, that's fine too. Let us hear the word. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And he said, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons of water. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus said, did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. May God, add, may God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. It must be hearkening back to those late 60s and 70s day, because in my sermon, I have a song called Signs. Signs, signs, everywhere there's signs. You know that song? It's a 1971 protest song by a band called Five Man Electrical Band. I'm not sure they ever had any other hits. That might have been the only one. The first verse talks about a sign for a job opening that says long-haired freaky people need not apply. John Carden... The singer says that he tucked his hair up under his hat, went in, got the job, and then said, look at me, you think I could work for you as his hair falls down? The second verse is about a trespassing song, or a, a trespassing sign. The writer's not pleased that the owner thinks that he can keep nature in or people out. The third verse is about a no-shoes no shirt, no service sign attached to a place where you've got to be a member to be able to come and eat. And of course, the chorus says, sign, sign, everywhere a sign, blocking out the scenery, breaking my mind. Do this, don't do that. Can't you read the sign? Can't you read the sign? The last verse is about church. The sign says, everyone is welcome. 
And then they pass the offering plate. That's when the songwriter, the singer, takes out a pen and a piece of paper and writes his own sign that says, Thank you, Lord, for thinking about me. I'm alive and doing fine. Sign, sign, everywhere, sign. There have been some interesting church signs. I looked it up on the internet to make sure I knew of a few. One that says, honk if you love Jesus. Text if you want, text while driving if you want a meeting. (laughs) I thought that was a pretty useful sign. What if the hokey pokey is what it's all about? I think that Bill Frumas shared that on Facebook once or twice. Don't let worries kill you. Let the church help. (laughs) Think about it. Think about it. If you're the one praying for all the snow, please stop. God is listening. That was last year. I think that was pretty famous. There is also that famous sign, billboards by God, a Florida advertising agency was given a lot of money, millions of dollars, to launch a nationwide um, campaign. It started down in Florida and has moved beyond um, billboards that were notes from God to all who could read the billboard. A note that says something like, let's meet at my house before the game on Sunday. God. Have you read my number one bestseller? God. Oh, there's another line to that. There will be a test. And then some about love. That love thy neighbor thing, I meant that, God. Tell the kids, I love them, God. I love this last one. I love you, I love you, I love you, God. Signs are all around us. What they say to us, how they speak to us, depends a lot on us. How we read them, what mood we are in when we read them, if we understand them. Today's passage in the Gospel of John is Jesus' first sign of his act of ministry. Turning water into water. Wine is his first official sign to the world. This is who I am, and this is who I'm called to be, and this is what I'm going to be about. Now, he gets into this, this, this situation at his mother's urging. Anybody ever had that experience before? In the first chapter of the Gospel of John, Jesus kind of comes onto the scene. It's an intro to the to the book for the word was with God and the word was God. You remember some of that poetic language maybe, but right after that we get a lot of the John the Baptist stuff where John is in the wilderness baptizing and he's telling people you need to pay attention, but in the Gospel of John in a unique way he talks, um, John the Baptist talks to specific people and in a unique way Jesus has conversation with people and calls his first disciples. Even this story that we're reading today is not in any other gospel. John is very unique in some of the stories that he tells. This story is not in any other gospel. And it is the first sign of Jesus' ministry in the gospel of John. He comes to a wedding. And back in those days, weddings didn't take just a day. No wedding really takes just a day. If you've ever been a bride or a groom or the parent of a bride or a groom, you know that. But we tend to have the wedding and the celebration in a day. But in those days, the likelihood of having to travel long distances, either by walking or animals that we don't ride on a regular basis around these parts of the world, 
you had to come from far away more than likely. And so people would come and they would come for days. And so if you were hosting a wedding, it was a party, it was a feast, it was a festival, it was a holiday. It took two or three or four or five days, maybe even a week because you didn't come just for the day. So there would be lots of eating and there would be lots of drinking over more than one day. And so the steward makes an interesting claim at the tasting of the wine, but there would have been no wine to taste because either the people drank a lot or the host didn't have a lot. Either way, Jesus has been invited to this wedding. His mother has been invited to this wedding. There is no wine, and she says, Jesus, do something about this. You see, she has a glimpse of who he's supposed to be, at least in the Gospel of John. In other Gospels, it's not so clear, but in the Gospel of John, she has a sense because his response to her is pretty clear. It's not my time. The Gospel uses the word woman, but I would think, wouldn't he say mom? Mom, what's that got to do with us? It's not my time. Is Jesus anxious? Is Jesus not ready? Is it truly not his time? Does Mary have so much pull over her son that even though the son of God's time hasn't come, she can say, "Mm, do this anyway? Interesting questions to me. No matter what, Jesus determines that he will provide the sign, that he will bring wine to the festival to the wedding. And so he tells the servants what to do. There are really only um, three groups of people who, who understand what has happened in the whole process of, of the wine running out and more wine coming. There's Mary, who started the process. There are the disciples, and there are the servants, who are told by Mary, do everything he tells you. This is the same exact language that Pharaoh gives to all the Egyptian leadership when it comes to, I'm going to forget a name, Joseph and the the big coat. Joseph, when Joseph takes over as second in command in Egypt, Pharaoh says, do everything he tells you. So this is language that's probably intentional on on the writer's part, on John's part, to say, look, this is powerful language. Do everything he tells you. Just like Joseph was um, given power and authority, now Jesus is given power and authority. Mary uses this language because she understands who he is. So he tells them what to do when they take the purification rite pots and they fill them with water, and you know the story from there because I just read it to you. You probably knew it before. And the chief steward says, this is the best wine. This is unusual. The best wine is usually not kept for when people have had a taste of wine or two. Usually that's served first so that the person can look good in the eyes of the people. When their taste buds have deadened a little bit, that's when the cheap stuff is served. But you, O oh bridegroom and family, have done this differently. Now, I don't know exactly what claim that makes I'm not exactly sure what claim that makes other than if Jesus is new wine, the greatest has just come. Because of what Jesus has done, the disciples believe in him. Now, they've just left their families. They've just said yes. You would think that they have a lot of energy for following Jesus, but this cements their belief. Well, I've done a good thing by leaving my family. I've seen this act. I've seen this abundance of wine come from Jesus' hand. I can now believe. Would you? Would that do it? If you were witnessing and seeing what had happened, would that be enough faith for you? One of the commentators that I was reading talks about this this miracle 
this gift being more than good. It's great wine. Talking about being more than enough that was needed. It was a lot of pots with a lot of um, fluid. The water becomes wine. It's an abundance of wine. In his mind, the commentator is saying this is an abundance of grace, that Jesus has now come into the world and is living the ministry he was supposed to live. He's becoming who Mary thought he would become. He's becoming something that the disciples can believe on. He's amazed the servants and even the chief steward who doesn't even understand exactly what's happened. Jesus is the sign of God's love and grace in the world in abundance. There's an old story about a woman who goes to her religious authority, her teacher, and she says, which of the world's religions is greatest? Which one has it right? And the teacher tells a story. Does that sound a little bit like what Jesus would do? Tell a story. The teacher tells a story. He says, there was once a magic ring that provided to the person who wore it the powers of um, generosity and kindness and grace. And this man had been the owner of it and was on his deathbed. And each of his three sons came and asked for the ring, which he said to each of them, I will give to you. So then he hired the greatest... um, jeweler in the land to come, and he said, I would like for you to make two identical rings to this one. And then he provided, before his death, a ring to each of his sons. Down the road, years later, the sons all figured out that they had the same ring. And so they went to a judge and said, we need to know who has the true ring and which to have the fake ring. And the judge took the rings and examined them and looked at them and said, I can't tell. Handed the rings back to them and said, and why do we have to judge anyway? Won't we know who has the true ring by the way you live your lives? So what do you think happened? Each of the sons went and lived his life in such a way that they provided generosity and grace and kindness to the world. The teacher says, the same is true for religions. When they stop bringing peace and love and justice into the world, we'll know that that religion was not the true religion God meant for the world. What does that say about us as believers of Jesus? As followers of Christ, Jesus, who is the sign of God's love and grace in the world, Jesus, the one whom we follow, what are we supposed to do? Live our lives accordingly. When I was 20 years old, I was finishing my second semester at Phillips University in Enid, Oklahoma, which is one of our disciple schools, a great school that no longer exists. When most of your um, alums are choir directors and ministers for 50 or 60 years, it's hard to build up a big endowment. I got a call from an admissions counselor. His name is Todd Moore. And he said, Kelly, I took a phone call from a church in Edmond, Oklahoma, Southern Hills Christian Church, and they're going to call my office back in about 10 minutes. They have a job this summer, and I think you'd be perfect for it. I was like, I'm trying to take a nap and watch the Cubs. (laughs) I ran over to the admissions office, and um, Diane Hilbig called. She was the associate minister at the church. And um, we spoke and set a time for an interview about two weeks later. I really was scheduled to, like, go home the very next day. I just finished finals. So I went home, and all the way home, 
I'm having this conversation with God. I'm a religion major. I'm planning to do ministry in the church. I love the church. What am I supposed to do? So I started bargaining with God. Have you ever done that? I'm not sure that God actually works in this way, by the way. I'm pretty sure that God doesn't, but I was bargaining anyway. Well, I'll go home, and I'll apply, and if I find a job, then I won't take that one. So I went home, and I applied everywhere that you could apply in the town of Claremore, Oklahoma. That's not a lot of places. But we had a Walmart and a Long John Silver's. A classmate of mine, two years ago, we were walking across the graduation stage in high school. She's now the, admin, uh, the assistant manager, um, probably going to school in town. And she said to me, well, I don't think you're in this for the long haul, so I'm not going to hire you. And she was right. I was looking for a summer job. I couldn't even get hired at Long John's. Went for the interview, continued the bargaining, talking to my folks. I was 20. My mom thought that was a little young. I did end up taking the job. But here's the point that I want to make. I made the search all about me. What am I supposed to be doing? How will I know if I'm supposed to take this job? When the process was probably all about God. And maybe, maybe I was supposed to be the sign to that church instead of them being the sign for me or God providing me some sign. We follow Jesus into the baptistry because he got baptized. And after being baptized, he provides his first sign to the world. If you've been baptized, what was your first sign? Jesus didn't stop at one, though, right? Jesus continued to live his life in a way that tried to honor God and bring God's presence to the world. My friends, not just a first sign, but every day a sign. Bringing God's love and presence into the world, following in the footsteps of Jesus the Christ. This is our faith. This is who we are called to be. In Christ's name, may it be so. Amen.
please be seated as we gather around the table. If there were a sign that we would want to hang near or around this table, it would be that all who call upon the name of Christ are welcome at this table. There is a sign on the front of the table that says, in remembrance of me or in remembrance of him. Those are two pretty good signs. All who believe in Jesus and call upon him are called to this table to remember him. We may not agree on every little point of theological debate. We may not agree on politics at all, but we can agree that Jesus is the center of our lives and we can come to this table together, unified in faith. So let us come. Bring your heart, whether it's joyful or hurting, bring your heart, meet your God, remember the one who brings abundance of love and grace to us. Let us pray. Holy God, once again, we gather at this table to honor your command that we do this in remembrance of you. We seek to live the love that you modeled and taught us. This bread represents your body and in its broken state represents the suffering you endured for the sake of our salvation. As we partake of this element, strengthen our resolve to be the Christians you would have us be. May we be your signs in this life. In your holy name we pray, amen. In the violence of the storm, we experience your power, majestic God. In the flash of the lightning, we see your glory. In the peace of a starry night, in every breath we take, we discover your creation, energy, and awesome beauty of your holiness. The cup that we now drink serves as a reminder that Christ loves for our, each of us eternal, strengthening us in your spirit. When Jesus sat at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it and he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. After the meal, he took wine and he blessed it. And he poured it. And he gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink from this cup, remember me. As one family in faith, let us remember our Christ as we eat and as we drink and as we find the abundance of grace and love.
up this morning, I asked myself, what are some of the secrets of success of life? I found the answers right here in my room. The fan said, be cool. The roof said, aim high. The window said, see the world. The clock said, every minute is precious. The mirror said, reflect before you act. The door said, push hard for your goals. And don't forget the carpet said, kneel down and pray. Have a nice day. The deacons will now collect your tithes and offerings. Shall we pray? Heavenly Father, thank you for the blessings you have given each of us, thus allowing for us to give, give to you. Blessed this offering given and those who have given it. Amen. We come to that time in our service where we make promises as we prepare to go out into the world to be a sign. Um, we make promises on how we want to live. And so let us make those promises now. If part of that promise making processes, becoming a member of First Christian Church for you, we invite you as we sing our closing hymn. Our closing hymn is number 176, Sing of God May Manifest, and we're going to sing verses 1, 3, and 4. 1, 3, and 4. Let us sing.
Annetta Holt has come into the building. Let the celebration commence. She came in, she's sitting on the back row, and I'm going to have her come um, down the back steps with me. I'm not going to stand at a door and greet, and I'm not going to allow you guys, if you will please do so, <laughs> to stay here and greet each other. Let's go quickly down into the basement that we can greet each other there and have our celebration grant. And Tim, I'm going to want to take this microphone with us so that we can have a sound system downstairs, so let's leave everything live. Sorry about that little bit of information. So... We go forth following in the footsteps of Jesus who brought a first sign and who was a living sign. Let us go and be a living sign for God in this world. In the name of Christ. Amen. Amen.